We are the digital show at the Cape Town Conversation 2024, and we're here to talk about food security, the resilience, and innovative works on how we can have a smart climate agriculture. So my name is Isibo Aigbe Wahina. I'm a legal practitioner with the Central Bank of Nigeria and also a climate reality leader. With me, I'm with uh, Judith Mawendi, then Stephanie Petuzelli. So we're going to talk about climate smart agriculture. Thank you so much. So Judith, over to you to the first question. Um, being an independent researcher from Italy, from, sorry, um, a livelihood for food security, and a specialist from Kenya, uh, with valuable grounds and experience on community and driven solutions. So what sustainable agricultural practice best enhance food security? Why environmental sustainability across diverse regions? What's your take on that? Uh, thank you. And um, we have to acknowledge that the world's agricultural systems continue facing um, challenges, mainly because we see a decrease in arable land, climate variability, and all these changes coupled with um, the world just recently recovering from a pandemic, and also uh, knowing that nowadays um, our soils are not what they used to be, um, there's need to rethink our, our food systems, and if we, especially if we are to produce and produce sustainably. So among especially uh, smallholder farmers, part of the practices that uh, farmers do take and are supposed to include one, um, agroecological practices, such as now integrating traditional knowledge into, into, into what they do, diversification, uh, like what we call intercropping systems, you know, planting uh, mixed cropping systems as well as live uh, animal husbandry practices that regenerate the soils, but naturally, agroforestry, growing crops mixed with uh, trees uh, in terms of now one uh, trying, to, trying to improve on carbon sequestration and all that. Um, and also thinking around regenerative agriculture for soil health, to make sure that even as we even as we're taking out of the soil, we are working towards regeneration. And part of also regenerative ag agriculture is to make sure that um, they, we, we are moving away from use of a lot of pesticides, use of artificial fertilizer into practices such as mulching, uh, such as you know use of crop, you know, plowing back crop residue into into the farms, and of course maintaining maintaining the soil. Um, minimal agriculture or minimal tillage, meaning you're disturbing the soil to the to the least possible levels, to just make you know help the soil regenerate on its own. Um, part of also practices that can be taken up uh, include precision farming, and um, you know practices to optimize nutrient intake, water availability. Noting that water has also become a very um, sensitive resource in terms of food production. And therefore, even as farmers look into getting uh, to produce and to um, get into sustainable agricultural practices, these are some of the farm level practices that are not only very efficient, but also very easy to work with or to, to incorporate. Um, on top of that, as we talk of cropping systems. Remember, at the end of it all, we're looking at food and nutrition, yeah. sustainability. And when you do diversified cropping systems, it means if, say, for instance, um, a community is, say, maize growing, you intercrop maize with, say, beans or potatoes. So it means you have two crops um, of different levels, two crops of different food groups as well, which means uh, you're also increasing the dietary diversity of the household and at a household level. And on top of that, the two crops um, offer different, or rather take in and give in different levels of nutrients to the soil. Uh, for instance, uh, legumes are carbon fixing. So it means there's a level of regeneration that they're doing into the soil. Um, again, when we talk of uh, agroecological practices like no-till, it means it's cheaper for the farmer, it's easier. And it's something that the farmers don't even need to, it's not technical. So it's not that heavy on investment. 
Um, then on uh, soil health re uh, restoration, that is do uh, practices such as cover crops, introducing cover crops to reduce on soil erosion, composting, and reduced tillage to improve soil fertility. All these are farm level initiatives that will go a long way and will only take just some level of knowledge. So Stephanie, based on your research, what sustainable agriculture would you recommend that is climate friendly? That's climate friendly and environment because of the environment as well. So based on your research, what would you recommend? Okay, thanks. Um, first of all, I'm, I totally agree with Judith uh, because uh, I think that regenerative uh, agriculture or agroecology or agroforestry um, are very important. Uh, but uh, um, as a sector upon which uh, humanity depends, uh, um, agriculture necessitates a profound rethinking. So climate smart agriculture, for example, represents one of the most comprehensive uh, frameworks uh, to tackle this dual challenge as it uh, integrates uh, um, three key, key objectives, for, um, in my opinion. First, uh, enhancing productivity and income. Second, strengthening adaptability. And third, um, I mean, tailor, um, create a solution tailored to the climatic, economic, and social condition to each region. So uh, the other thing uh, things in, is that um, it uh, can reduce also greenhouse gas emission, and this is very important in this time. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, uh, climate uh, smart agriculture adoption in the indo gangetic plain has demonstrated that, um, um, uh, I mean, has demonstrated a 20% increase in rice productivity while reducing water use by 30%. However, significant barriers persist. Um, for example, high initial investments, uh, yield uh, volatility, skill gaps, uh, for, of course, uh, and um, um, lack of uh, policy coordination, um, and uh, of course, uh, limited uh, financial support. Um, I think that uh, it is very important uh, to think about uh, climate smart agriculture also because um, it was uh, a point in COP29. At COP29, agriculture was in discussion, but uh, in my opinion, not. Uh, um, it was uh, underestimated also this time in global, um, I mean, in global strategies. However, the Baku Harmonia Initiative, um, promoted by FAO and the COP29 presidency, aims to transform agri-food system to be more clima uh, clima climate re um, resilient by fostering global collaboration and uh, catalyzing uh, sustainable investments and uh, supporting rural communities uh, with a focus on human and youth. And another thing uh, that emerged uh, in the COP, uh, on, uh, at the COP29 was the AIM for climate um, by the United States and uh, the United Arab Emirates that um, reiterated for the second time, I think, uh, yeah, the importance of research and innovation in mitigating agriculture's climate impact uh, and bolstering the resilience uh, of food systems. So uh, the future of agriculture requires, in my opinion, uh, an, at, um, um, a unified vision, uh, one that aligns local actions, uh, of course, uh, with global frameworks, but foster innovation, prioritize uh, sustainability as a moral and uh, existential imperative. At the, these needs, uh, of course, the, the, the practice that, um, Judith uh, um, mentioned, but also a boost for innovation and for technologies. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, building on that, let's dis discuss innovation. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, how do you see technological advancements playing a role in increasing food production, improving resources efficiency, 
and reducing agricultural waste. Yes, I think that uh, technological innovation are uh, transforming agriculture, offering uh, opportunities to increase uh, food production, uh, enhance resource efficiency, and minimize agricultural waste. Uh, for example, of course, uh, AI or uh, Internet of Things uh, or robotics uh, are transforming crop management uh, by enabling a precise uh, real-time mon monitoring of soil uh, plant condition. And um, for example, another example, I'm sorry, is um, um, pre precision, uh, precision agriculture. Yes, that integrates sensor, uh, satellite data, and advanced um, analytics to optimize uh, water use, uh, for example. And another thing that uh, it could be very interesting to mention is the blockchain technologies, because the block te blockchain technology is another transformative tool that enhances traceability along the agriculture supply chain, improving transparency and security and reduce uh, insufficiency, uh, minimize losses, uh, and um, ensure greater account accountability from farm to consumer. So on, on the precision farming, like what I've gotten from what you've said now, yes. basically, you are talking about advisory service for farmers, like giving them these extensions, like extension services, telling them the right time to farm in terms of agriculture. So that's where I'm going to come to uh, Judith now. So in Kenya, or basically in Africa, how do you see, what is the technological advancement in terms of this? Um, it's important to note that 80% um, of farmers in Africa are smallholder farmers. And um, sometimes, especially among smallholders, there may not be a lot of technological advancement and uh, or a lot of technology uptake. But there really still is a lot we can do, and especially riding on especially mobile platforms for advisory services. Uh, it could be as simple as maybe an app. It could be as simple as uh, riding on mobile services for, um, yeah, exactly, especially for um, like input, okay, to allow them or enable them access credit to enable them be able to get their produce to market, to pay for and okay. yeah, and, and, and of takers and all that. And even as we look at it, um, you know, from the small hold, holder angle and the spirit of making sure that we are not leaving anyone behind, there's need to address and make sure we, we are addressing equity and in inclusion. Because again, remember, uh, small holder farmers are mainly women. It is the women that do the actual farm work. They don't want to provide the staple food. They are the ones that do the most jobs in terms of exactly. food security. Exactly. And, and at, the, at the end of the day, it's also women that are in charge of the household's nutrition. Yeah. So in short, they're the people that do the production. And they're also the people that make sure that this, this food ends up at the dinner table. And if we were to think about the agricultural um, value chain end to end, we cannot forget about women and the space they occupy and their role in all this. And um, as we look at supporting um, agriculture, there is need to make sure that um, whatever whatever initiatives we're doing, we we are we we are targeting especially. Okay, not exactly targeting especially, but we are also thinking about how do we bring in the aspect of women as the people that do the work. Um, the need to the access to resources. How do we get the resources to them? Remembering again, in most of the aspects that the ones that are that are left behind, even though they do most of the work, they have to be included. One at the decision making processes. Yeah. If we are talking about policy, it's the aspect of you know making making decisions for people when they are present. You know, not making decisions on high level forums like here and taking them so down. So basically, you're saying the government should have impactful and responsive policies that will, that will definitely put women that have been marginalized and they should be at the forefront of the table. So now that brings me to this question, which will be the final question. So let's turn to policy. Judith, from your perspective, how can international policy framework better support sustainable agriculture and global food security? I know you've made some points on that, but I just need you to maybe portray more on what you've said then. I'll leave it for Stephanie to round up. 
One, partnerships, especially among multilateral organizations. Um, partnerships could be knowledge exchange, information exchange, support um, for, for like with climate subsidies, risk or other insurance for farmers, you know, risk-based insurance for farmers to just make sure that they are not being left behind, be it in the financial systems or in, in whatever we're doing. So um, we have organizations, the LECD of International Livestock Research Institute, um, organizations that are involved in agricultural research, organizations that fund, do agri-financing. So again, there's, a, there's need for a lot of cooperation and collaboration, especially between the Global North, Global South, among research institutions, um, universities, and the local farmer. So thank you so much. So Stephanie, I'm going to turn to you. Stephanie, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn to you now. What global policy changes would you prioritize to address this? Yes, in my opinion, uh, international policy framework uh, are essential in promoting uh, sustainable agriculture. Um, a landmark example, in my opinion, is uh, the VGGT adopted by F uh, FAO uh, in uh, um, 2012, uh, yes, which provides a foundation for equitable access to resources, particularly in vulner vulnerable and uh, resource constrained re regions. But uh, I think that another good example now uh, is in Europe with the clim um, I'm sorry, cli uh, clean industrial deal. That is a um, kind of evolution of the previous uh, European uh, Green Deal launched uh, in uh, 2023 and um, that uh, it uh, represents a multidimensional uh, approach to sustainability because it combines uh, incentives for green technologies uh, and uh, renewable en energy with uh, food systems. Uh, so not only food system, but also induce industries around them. And I think that is very important uh, to improve uh, our uh, ecology because the, the ecology needs to think uh, as an uh, integral ecology, not only about food, but about uh, society, politics, and economy. System holistically, not just as exactly. the agricultural system, but the other systems that feed into the agricultural system. So to wrap this up right now, so I want to thank Stephanie, Stefania, and Judith for their brilliant contribution to innovation, technology, and how we can boost the climate resilience and also farmers and also talk, they talked about extension service, talked about how they can talk about bring improved seedlings and the government policies has to play a major role on enhancing and empowering women because they are the most affected with the climate change. They are the most affected because they are the one who go out there in the farm to get this staple food to the table. So they need to be on the table for policies. Policies need to be gender inclusive and impactful as well. So this can also boost agricultural um, food security and also enhance growth in the, in the economy. Thank you so much for joining.